Peter was really committed to the idea of doing a lot of miniature work in our films, which is not necessarily typical today because you can do so much with pure CG. Pete loves miniatures. He's often said that if he couldn't be a director, he would want to be a miniature cameraman. I think he just likes being around them. Of course, you can see that. His background, way back the time when he was a young man, he was building miniatures and he was shooting them, blowing them up. You never get that out of your blood. It's the world's biggest electric train. Pete's the biggest kid of all. The film is kind of incidental, really. <laughs> it's, it's playing with the toys, which is the main thing. And, you know, they're beautiful objects. The guys at the workshop and the miniatures unit put a fantastic amount of care and love into everything that they did. I think it's really evident in the films. If you look at them, you can see how rich those miniatures are and how realistic they are. They add something that you wouldn't get any other way. Minas Morgul's original name was Minas Ithil, and it was a Gondorian city and the sister city of Minas Tirith before falling into Sauron's hands. So we wanted it to evoke Minas Tirith, but have a different design sense. And uh, this prow of rock that divides Minas Tirith was a design element that I decided to carry over into Minas Morgul, in that these promontories of rock be reproduced in the battlements. So John Howe created this city, which in itself would have had a beauty to it. But what has happened since the orcs took over that part of the land is that they have put iron balustrades around, which have stained the side of these beautiful white walls, all these rust stains. And uh, I have very vivid memories of having my wisdom teeth pulled and this dentist clamping my wisdom teeth in these sort of jaws. And I wanted to try and convey some of that horrid notion of metal clamping onto and digging into enamel, or in this case, the white stone of Minas Morgul. This is 120th scale of Minas Morgul. The whole set is built specifically to have the camera gradually go higher and higher and higher up the valley, looking down past the hobbits as they climb. And then we've also got one that's three times bigger than this for the, for the close-ups. And it has a green glow, which is part of the book, describing a supernatural kind of swamp paler indeed than the moon ailing in some slow eclipse was the light of it now, wavering and blowing like a noisome exhalation of decay, a corpse light, a light that illuminated nothing. So we, we painted with this, with this glow paint and then we light it with ultraviolet to produce this sickly look, but then when we turn the UV lights off, then we can just light it in, in a normal way, so you have, actually have the normal moonlight in addition without seeing this stuff. So there's actually four different lighting schemes at work, all of which are used to produce the final effect. Kirithunga was built by the ancient Numenorians as a uh, fortress guarding the borders of Mordor. It's the one that the orcs have really taken over, and made, made it their own. I'd initially done a sketch which was pretty close to the description in the book, but that initial design ended up being judged pretty boring. I revisited the whole thing and basically pulled the fortress away from the slope of the mountain and placed it out on this rocky pinnacle. And uh, each successive courtyard is at an angle to the one below it. So it is faithful to the description in the book, but gives it more of a crazy, vertiginous aspect. The first time you see it is um, from Shelob's Lair, actually. You see just the top of the tower. And they actually took it off the miniature and took it down to the shooting stage and plonked it at the end of that set. This is a very rare moment that we actually have a tangible tower in the background. Um, so this is, a, this is kind of a special moment. Because normally we have like a blue screen to look at. And now we don't have to use our imagination because there it is. When it came back, I was able to put some more detail because I had heard there was going to be some close-ups on it. Part of the richness of any miniature is the amount of fine texture you can get into it. And just looking at a huge stone building isn't very interesting. But as soon as you can hang a few chains on it and knock some holes in it and texture it up, of course, then it starts to be more interesting and it starts to be more believable. It was my favorite of the orcish sets because of that tremendous sense of detail. Everything about it was sort of macabre, gothic quality. So it was a joy to light. You couldn't light it wrong. You just put back cross light on it and it looks fantastic. I really remember wondering what the paths of the dead could be, and Peter 
simply didn't want a dark, damp hole. Peter wanted another world inside. And um, I did some drawings of this necropolis, which would actually have the tomb of the King of the Dead as a central focus. The actual structures themselves have the same kind of feel of, of this place called Petra in Jordan. And, um, you know, I know that when they were doing the early design, you know, people actually talked about that as a reference point. And Peter decides that the necropolis should crack open and release the skulls of these thousands and thousands of people who've been interred there over the years. So initially it was like, can you make 200 skulls? No problem. And then it came back, oh, 2,000, no problem. It might take a week. And then 2,000 became 6,000, 6,000 became 10,000, 10,000 became 20,000, ultimately 60,000. And then in the end we needed to get 20,000 more, 80,000 skulls. And you say, ah, it's an awful lot of skulls. No, it's not. It's just barely one cubic metre of skulls. So one cubic metre of skulls having to be built into this huge set. You have to load these things and then just hope that nothing gives way until you actually have the camera rolling. The slightest bit of vibration would crumble the whole thing and then we had to go in and start again. So uh, this took more engineering than, than any other physical uh, effect that we did. But we managed to make it work finally. Brilliant! <laughs> Absolutely great, guys. Well, they'd also done a lot of live action shooting of full-size skulls. <laughs> Once we rolled the skulls down, we had to pick them all up and take them back to the top and do it again. It was sort of fun. You know, people had bags and we were sort of like shooting baskets. And after a while, throwing skulls at each other, it was kind of, kind of a weird atmosphere. We had to extend those shots. We would work out what the angle had to be to match the live action full-size piece and then start the, the cascade of skulls up so that we could make it look like the avalanche just sort of stretched away into the distance. Dennis Tirith is Tolkien's greatest architectural invention. It's absolutely gigantic. In the real world, it would have been uh, almost a third of a mile high, 1,700 feet. Now think of this. When we were shooting the two towers, our major set piece was Helm's Deep, a gigantic fortress, and Minas Tirith dwarfs Helm's Deep. Minas Tirith was one of the first miniatures that we did for the third film, and that was based on Alan Lee's drawings. I sort of approached it on two fronts, really, and one was going through the front door and taking a very close-up view of the city as it unfolds. And at the same time, I started thinking about the wider view. The way that the model was developed was not dissimilar to the way that the city would have, would have grown and changed and gradually been built up over the years. And actually having a whole group of model makers on it was really helpful in that respect. They'd each be an architect from, from a different period that would be doing their own little speculative development. We installed over a thousand individual houses to make up the habitations of the streets of Minas Tirith. Minas Tirith in its entirety was built at 172nd scale. So Minas Tirith was as big as our room. We couldn't make it physically any bigger. The buildings at the top were just scraping the beams on the underside of our miniatures building room. The complete set of Minas Tirith was seven metres tall and six and a half metres in diameter. It's an enormous structure. We also built large sections of the walls and roads of Minas Tirith at 14th scale. That's a scale that's really big enough for you to walk through the city streets. You can duck down and look through the little doors and windows. We use this one to shoot. Uh, close detail shots that wouldn't stand up on the other set. This is beautifully detailed to the point where you can go closer and closer and closer and you keep seeing more and more. When I saw Minas Tirith for the first time in the cinema, I just was so impressed. I have never been so impressed in my life. I, I just don't think I blinked for the whole sequence. I kept wishing as I was watching the film, wouldn't it be wonderful to just stroll in the streets of Minas Tirith? The scale of that vision is just incredible, and where have we seen anything like that before? The trebuchets in Minas Tirith were proper medieval lever artillery as opposed to catapults. The catapults are basically like slingshots, and a trebuchet would be more the equivalent of a sling with a 
pretty substantial weight on the end of an arm with a fulcrum in the middle. So you're actually using the momentum of a sling on the end of a very long wooden beam. In theory, there's no limit to how big, big you could make them or the size of thing you could throw. The medieval illustrations that remain are very difficult to interpret because the same element may actually be drawn from the side at the top, from the front in the middle and from the other side at the bottom. And John built a little tabletop one. One of the ones we actually built for the 72nd scale model, I was just kind of intrigued to see if it would work. He was working on his table one day and this pencil eraser went winging past my head. I went, wee, what was that? And I used to shoot rubbers over to Mary at her desk on the other side of the room. All I know is I managed to get my hands on a little trebuchet and fling some razors back. <laughs> The next one he built was probably about 14th scale. That was a real beauty. And he, he got that so beautifully weighted that he could throw a pencil razor the length of the car park. <laughs> Firing lumps of clay across the car park into the bushes at the end of our workshop. And um, we had a great time with that. A bunch of big kids playing with these amazing toys, which they're privileged enough to be able to spend their working lives around. <laughs> a huge battering ram with its head in the shape of a wolf. It's a um, very, very daring graphic element for Tolkien to have actually, actually described. Great engines crawled across the field, and in the midst was a huge ram, great as a forest tree a hundred feet in length, swinging on mighty chains. Long had it been forging in the dark smithies of Mordor, and its hideous head founded of black steel was shaped in the likeness of a ravening wolf. The wolf-headed battering ram that Tolkien described, we wanted to take one step further and in fact made the whole of the battering ram to look like a massive cast iron wolf. The model of the battering ram itself of Grand was, was quite huge. It was the size of like a van. And it was all clad in lead. It was very, very heavy. Working with lead is uh, fairly, it's a toxic metal. We're not going to take chances, so we wear gloves and touch it as little as possible. It's certainly a beautiful metal to work with, so malleable and shapeable. We decided to cover the whole thing in inscriptions as well. And I know that one has lots of spelling mistakes. <laughs> Mordor spelling mistakes. And the Tolkien experts will be able to read it, but for everybody else, it says, no war between, no power against, no endurance of souls, grond, the will of Mordor. And this is repeated all over the shoulders and a little bit over the eyes as well. Weta had built this miniature of Grand when it had sat in storage for forever. Some people thought we were never going to shoot it, it was never going to appear in the movies, but at the last minute we wheeled it onto the stage. The brief was, you know, Grand hits the door, then Grand hits it again, and, you know, his nose comes through. And then Grand hits it a third time, and that's when it all breaks open and the doors fly open. Well, of course, that was you know, the theory, but when we went and shot it, the first time Grand went through, it just went smash through and it all came out. Yep. The model builder who actually built Grand was there taking care of his model, and it was my job to just smash it into doors over and over and over again, and this poor guy, you just see the look on his face. He gave the door a good whack yesterday, which broke a couple of his toes, but uh, just bend the lead back into shape and a bit of glue and he's back together again. I broke his claw, I broke his nose, you know, I, I just did everything and, and, you know, it didn't matter, it just had to be exciting. You had to feel the impact as it, as it smashed into the door. The Grey Havens boat did exist already in the conceptual art, but uh, we asked Alan for something a bit more concrete. I did one or two drawings showing the whole thing, and then I did some kind of plan and elevation drawings as well for John to get started. John is a boat enthusiast and has indeed even acted as a guide on a replica of Captain Cook's ship. He loves boats. He knows them intimately. He's, he builds his own. He's got his own little sailboat that he takes his family out on. The hull itself went together very quickly. I'm pretty sure we would have had most of it up in three or four days. We used plywood frames and diagonal plywood planking. And the, the figurehead, um, Richard carved that. 
It was great to get Richard out of the office and down into the workshop where he loves to be. Just going to have some beers at the boat. It's actually fully watertight, that boat, so it'd be nice to think that it would be able to sail away on the ocean one day. We don't quite see enough of, of the oven boat, but it was beautifully executed and um, very satisfying. Grey Havens originally was planned as a, a foreground element with a, with a matte painting in the background. So we had a foreground 14th scale miniature. A year later, we got word that they wanted really some more of the city. So we went back to the drawings and um, one of the influences for the Grey Havens was actually paintings that I had seen by Turner showing these exotic harbours with a view out to sea with the setting sun. Working in that set was one of the most rewarding of all the sequences that we did. And I think one of the reasons for that is that it represented all that we'd learned. We'd done so many big models prior to that that we were sort of quite a good team now. We could pretty much, yeah, there's your model right next. <laughs> and it was interesting to see how much their style had matured and their technique had matured. It was a beauty. Of all the units that we had shooting stuff on these movies, um, the longest serving, most loyal, hard working unit was um, the miniatures unit. I didn't set out to torture the miniatures department on purpose, but um, there was a weird thing of they never seemed to quite stop and they never knew when they were done with Lord of the Rings. I believe this may be the longest that a crew has ever shot on a, on a certain on an effects unit. They went a little bit strange in the head over that period of time. Every so often we would, uh, day 200, day 500, day 666, we'd have a little uh, party. I decided that we should have a party because it's cheat day 666 and it's a pretty um, historic, momentous occasion. You'll have to excuse the neck. This is our party this evening for the 666th shoot day. Next thing you know, there's devil music and there's devil invitation and everybody's wearing red suits and all this stuff. Lord High Executioner, oh. And then everybody's got to get up on the runway and do a little skit or whatever, so it's a lot of fun. Mr. Man himself, Alex looking forward to like shoot day 800 <laughs> maybe even 900 and then you know if you come and interview us then we're probably a little bit more whacked out than we already are those poor guys um, ended up shooting for over a thousand days people shoot feature films in 30 days and they were shooting those models for a thousand days and uh, I must admit it has been a long haul it's um, enough time to actually get to know people so well you know them too well <laughs> Even when we thought they'd shot their last shot and there was some sort of celebration, I then wanted the model of Orthanc to be dragged out so I could do a, a wide shot circling around for the extended edition. Everybody's sort of getting ready to go on holiday and then um, people start drinking. And then we get this phone call from Dean, right? And he's with Pete, he goes, I'm with Peter and we need another shot. Oh, they must be right in the middle of the rap party. <laughs> I can hear Peter laughing in the background and I tell the crew and they're like, oh, it's Peter's idea of a joke. They don't want it, they don't want it. I'm not joking. And so that's all right. The team knows how to do this stuff. They push on in, they start the motion control back up, light the set and shoot it. They're a unit with a wonderful spirit and obviously, you know, incredible skill because the miniatures are fantastic. When we started out, Everybody that we brought together was talented and able, but none of them had anything to do with actually shooting miniatures. And I would imagine that by now, these guys are as good a miniature crew as anyone in the world, if not the best miniature crew in the world. They've allowed us to create a Middle Earth, which is um, very definitely real. And uh, I think it makes a huge amount of difference to the engagement that you have with the films. So much of what the miniature department and Richard Taylor's team and Alan and John have done has actually enhanced what my imagination of the book was. And that, that's because it's gone so much beyond what I was imagining and had the input of all these other people who have contributed to it. And it's, and it's been one of the exciting aspects of working on these films.